is what you know, everybody considers to be the father of integrated marketing communication. So he is as big as it gets. Don, do we have a mother? <laughs> do we have a mother? Do you have a mother of IMC? You are the, you are the father of uh, IMC. No, it's a virgin birth. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Um, anyway, so Don's uh, done it all. Um, he was the main architect of the Northwestern uh, Medill School's IMC program, which I think they started about 20 years ago. So we are kind of behind the curve when we started our IMC program. Uh, Don's uh, worked in the uh, work with a lot of uh, big consult uh, big communication agencies such as uh, McCann Erickson, uh, BBDO, Leo Burnett, Dentsu, name it all. He's he's been everywhere, and he's consulted with IBM, Dell, Nortel, um, and some of the other very big Fortune 500 companies. Uh, so. Um, well, just to put it in perspective, when I asked Don uh, to send, him, send me his CV, he sent me one that was 35 pages long, okay? And then I started wondering why he never got another job in academia, because who was going to look at his 35-page CV? <laughs> uh, anyway, so that's uh, Don for you, and Don will uh, take over from here. Don? Thank you very much. I always tell people, never applaud in advance. Because you haven't heard the guy, and he may be terrible. And you can't get the applause back. So thank you, and thank you for the invitation. Uh, I'm very pleased in that introduction you did not mention some of the organizations I've consulted with have, who have since or are in the process of going out of business. Uh, so that, that, that is helpful. Uh, I noticed one thing. You feed students a hell of a lot better than we do. We give them day-old pizza, which we buy uh, on sale somewhere and bring it in. And that may be the reason we don't get very good attendance at our meetings, but uh, that's another story. Well, thank you for coming. I'm going to try to make this a conversation more than a lecture. Uh, I've heard all this stuff before, uh, but I haven't heard from you. So I don't know where you are, and I don't know what you're doing and how you're doing it. So uh, I'd like to have this more uh, as a discussion because, let's face it, we live in a world today, like it or not, that we can't predict the future. We have no clue what the future is going to be. And any faculty person who comes in and tells you that they can see what's going to happen and where you ought to go and what's going to occur uh, is not telling you the truth, primarily because we're all making it up as we go. And the reason for that is fairly simple. We live in a world that is changing and changing dramatically. We live in a world that, if you go back 10 years ago, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter, there was none of, this, none of the fancy dancy stuff that you see today. That's all 10 years old. And no one could have predicted that. So let me ask you a question just to start. When you wake up in the morning, or in the afternoon, depending on when your classes are, uh, what's the first thing you do? What do you reach for? Phone. Phone. How many of you jump up and go watch television? How many of you rush to the newsstand and find a newspaper? How many of you turn on the radio? A couple. But the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning is what? What in the hell happened last night? I really need to know. What's Justin Bieber up to? I mean, the real critical issues in the world. You live in a world that is untethered, unattached, until you attach to it. All this stuff is going on, but you're the one that decides what you're going to look for, what you're going to do, how you're going to do it. So you have control over the system. You control all the future of communication, of marketing, of all the other things that go along with it. 
It's all in your hands. Because if you don't turn on or tune in or open your mind or open your eyes, nothing happens. We've never had that before. This is a world that we've never, ever experienced. So part of the challenge here is, how do we think about that? How do we think about the world that you're going to be in? And I tell students all over the world, you're going to have to invent this stuff. I'm going to be gone. Severe's going to be gone. All the rest of them are all going to be gone. You're the ones that are going to have to figure out how this stuff works going forward. Because it is still, still incredibly unknown. We don't really have a clue of how it's going to turn out. So part of the problem is it's a tremendous challenge and opportunity, but it's a damn high risk for you because you have to make those decisions. You're the ones that are going to have to reinvent this stuff. You're the ones that are going to have to make some sense out of it. We have left you a trail of stuff that is primarily irrelevant today. But you're going to be the ones that have to figure out how to do it. So, that's what makes it, I think, really interesting for students, and particularly students in the marketing, communication, all that entire area. Well, I always have to do the mandatory. That's who I am. I'm making the assumption that most of you are literate and can read that. These are words. They're not pictures, they're not sounds. So these are words. Now how comfortable are you with words? Because the world you've grown up in has all been about sounds and pictures. So, you know, I've been around a long time. I do a lot of stuff overseas. I write a lot of books. I write a lot of columns. I write a bunch of stuff. Um, all words. All words. That's essentially irrelevant today. Because it's all about words that I've written, which probably are no longer as relevant as they used to be. Okay, let's start with a quiz. I always love to start a class or a group or an assemblage with, with a quiz, an exam to find out where you are. What's integrated marketing communication? Well, first of all, are you a major here? Are you? Um, I'm getting my master's in integrated marketing communication. Oh my God! Then you do the same thing. <laughs> Almost. Okay. Almost. I finished in August. Oh well, you won't know until late no, July. Well, I know that. I yeah, late know. July. You won't know. You won't know all of it until late July. Uh, yeah, mid August. Okay, so mid August. Okay, all right. What is this stuff that you're doing? Well, I mean, integrated marketing communication basically, basically has to do with the integration and utilization of different marketing platforms, mostly in the digital realm, to market a company's products and connect with consumers in ways that are engaging, uh, practical, and lucrative. That sounds really impressive. Could you write that down? Uh, could you write that down? Send, could you write that down and send it to me? Oh, so uh, I can rip that off? I'll, I'll, I'll <laughs> see if I can remember. Yeah, and I'll quote you. All right. <laughs> you can't put that in Twitter. The thing you had was like 300 words. Right. Okay. Here's another one. What is integrated marketing communication? You agree with him? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's right. <laughs> Move on. How about you? You agree with him, too. Well, let's try the female side. You agree with him? Oh my God, this is too easy. And what about you? I should have picked somebody who had a dumb one to start with. What do I think it is? Well, let me show you what our definition is. This is the definition for 2014 because we write a new definition every year. A street strategic business process. It's not just about communication. It's about how you run a business. Because critically important to every business going forward is how do they communicate, how do they talk to, how do they engage with, and how do they deal with customers. 
So it's a strategic business process used to plan, develop, execute, and evaluate. Evaluate is a thing that practically is never talked about. We all want to go out and do stuff. We want to do things. Evaluation is critically important. That's coordinated, measurable, and shared marketing communication programs over time with consumers, customers, prospects, employees, and other relevant external and internal audiences. The only argument I would have with the definition you gave me is you talked about media. Media is important, but it's not critical. Because there are lots and other ways that we can communicate and lots and lots and other ways that we have conversations and we relate to customers and other organizations that don't involve media or media forms. The other problem here is the goal is to generate, and you didn't mention this, you didn't say anything about financial returns. I said lucrative. Lucrative, well, that's lucrative for who? For companies and consumers. Oh, you added that at the end. <laughs> So the goal is to generate both short-term financial returns and build long-term brand, brand and shareholder value. What we're talking about is a very complex subject, which we try to bring down to a relatively few number of words. And that's hard to do. It's hard to do when every day a new activity, a new marketing tool, a new marketing ac action is developing. The world you lived in yesterday is not the world you live in today. How do you deal with that? Because what we've historically done in the academic community, let's go create a theory. Let's go create something that we can engrave in stone, and we can't do that anymore. Because it's dynamic and it's continuously changing. And that's the real challenge, I think, for you because you have to ad be adaptable, you have to change, you have to be someone who is accessible and acceptable to change on a continuing basis. Now the problem with change is what? What's the problem with change? What's the problem with change? There's risk to it. There's what? There's risk. Absolutely. And what it does is it puts you in a situation where you are almost guaranteed that you will fail at some point. And we don't like to fail. We don't like failure. And part of the problem here is if you live in a world of change, you live in a world of continuous failure and reinvention. And, reinvention. and that's the world you live in. Now, if you take my generation, we invented television, and television will be there for the ages, maybe. But the problem is you have to open your mind to this continuously changing system in which you live and which you operate. The definition continues to expand, evolve, and change as the marketplace develops. This is the big problem. We've got all kinds of stuff going on, I've written 28 textbooks, none of which are relevant today. I labored over them. I wanted to put the words down and I wanted to get the words just in the right order. I wanted to get everything just exactly right. But textbooks are about generalizations. And one of the things you have to understand is you live in a world where there are relatively few generalizations. Each and every one of you in this room is an individual. And you approach things differently, you look at things differently, you evaluate things differently, and what really happens is we can't generalize about you or what you're likely to do. So for a textbook writer, a textbook writer is all about generalizations. You pick up a textbook and it's list after list after list. 
It's a generalization. What happens when there are no generalizations? What happens when each and every one of you is unique, different, and has to be dealt with in that way? That's the world you live in. That's the challenge you've got. Well, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking about IMC, past, present, future. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on the past other than to let you know that this is not something that, uh, you know, came out of an opium pipe dream. It was actually out of marijuana. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking. Not really. <laughs> uh, how do you get started? Well, first of all, I come from a school out in the Midwest. Have any of you ever been to Northwestern? We're a famed football power. We were the only, we still hold a record, the NCAA record, for the most consecutive losses. And we're trying, we're going to try to start the, a new streak, and we're going to try to build on that. But Northwestern is a small <laughs> private school. We've only got about 7,500 students. Big graduate program. We're like you, only we're sitting on the, the side of a lake as opposed to sitting on the side of a river. But we've had a long history of marketing and communication. We actually started teaching marketing in 1902, I mean teaching advertising in 1902. And so we have a uh, claim to a lot of the advertising and conceptual values of advertising and so on. Now, why is that peacock, why is that peacock up there? What does that peacock represent? What's he doing? Why? Damn right, he's advertising. That's what he's doing. He's advertising. Look at me. Look at my big broad tail. Look how attractive I am. Oh boy, oh boy. And see how interested that hen is? <sighs> Seen that before. You know, and so on. So we started out with advertising. We started out with a study of advertising. Started with Walter Dill Scott. He was a psychology professor. He ended up being president of the university. But he first started writing in 1902, and he published the theory of advertising in 1903. We've taught advertising in Northwestern since 1905. It was initially in the business school, but it was later transferred to what we now call the Medill School of Journalism, Media, and Integrated Marketing Communication. The most unwieldy name for a school in the history of the world. Because nobody knows what the hell it means, including us. But the founders, the administration said, you've got to put it all in there. So we started teaching advertising in the business school initially, School of Commerce, transferred to journalism in the mid-1960s. And it's been there ever since. So here's the psychology and theory and practice. Here's the theory and practice of advertising. Scott was not very big on getting new names for his articles. But uh, the, a simple exposition of the principles of psychology in their relation to successful advertising. So we've been in this business for a long time. In the 1960s, we transferred all of that to the School of Journalism. And we had been teaching journalism at Northwestern, at Medill, since the middle 60s. And everything was fine. When I came to Medill, we had a very small program. There were like 45, 50 students. Very highly focused. Most of our graduates went to work for advertising agencies. We had the very best advertising training program for students to get a job in a big advertising agency that the world has ever known. And we were having a wonderful time. Faculty loved it, students loved it, everybody loved it, except what? The marketplace started to change agencies started to consolidate. 
So rather than coming and taking two students a year, two agencies would merge and they'd come and they'd take one. So here we are at a private institution, heavily dependent on tuition, creating brilliant knowledge about advertising, doing a really great job of trading students for a marketplace that you could see going away. What do you do? What do you do in a case like that? We had a situation where we either had to re reinvent or die. And I was too young to die. So I happened to be the chair at that time. So the first thing we started looking at was where are these other jobs coming from? What other kind of skills and capabilities did people need? And we discovered direct marketing. I was the initial editor of the Journal of Direct Marketing. And we discovered corporate public relations. So we had advertising, we had direct marketing, we had corporate public relations, all tracking through at the same time. We tripled the number of students that we had. We went from about 40 to 125 or so. And all of a sudden, it seemed to be working. And then we woke up one day and said, what? Yeah, we're all te we're teaching these students all the same thing. We're just calling it different stuff. So it's the same curriculum under three different titles. And we said, hmm, that's not going to work. So what you see here are the things that really changed it. The change of focus of advertising from an art to a science, and that's really where we are today. Shift of client spending went from media to sales, promotion, direct marketing, and so on. Agencies were all consolidating. Brand management kind of started and popped up. And industry organization all in lots of functional silos. So we were rolling along. We started our integrated program. And the industry people came to us and said, can you help us? For the first time in my experience, the industry people went to the university and said, we need help. Because remember, most of the time, the industry people say, well, what the hell they're teaching over, you know, those things that they're teaching at the university are worthless. It's, you know, they're doing esoteric research and all that sort of thing. But what really happened is they came to us, this is the American Association of Advertising Agencies the Association of National Advertising, the American Advertising Federation, said, we got a problem, can you help us? Because we've got the same problems. I'm an advertising agency, I go buy a PR agency because my client wants that. Or I see money shifting into direct marketing. So I go buy a, a DM agency. And I bring them in together, and what happens? They can't talk to each other. They won't talk to each other. They don't talk to each other. So they said, can you help us? And that's really how we got started. How do you create an organization that does not look at media first? How do you create an organization where the first thing that people do is not say, how much should we spend on television? But they say, how do we reach customers? So this is what really changes. How do you bring these functional silos together? We've been at this now for about 25 years. Industry has still got the same problems. They cannot get their people to talk to each other. They can't get them to work together. And so part of the challenge here is integrated marketing communication. Everybody agrees it's a great concept, a great idea, a great approach for somebody else, but not for us, because we don't know how to do it. And that's been the challenge all these years. So the question was, who drives integration, agencies or clients? Well, that's fairly simple. Clients all drive integration. That's, that's a non sequitur. So our first response to that issue was this. We wrote a book in 1991, 92, came out in 93, that says integrated marketing communication, putting it together and making it work. Now, I will tell you in that book, if you go look at it, it is all about how do you make all the communication activities look the same, feel the same. And the theme we were using is one sight, one sound. That is, everything coming from the organization needs to be the same. 
That was done in 19, the 1990s. Quite honestly, in many cases, we have not gotten much further than that. It's still all about how do you make it look the same, how do you make it sound the same, how do you make it feel the same. We discovered then, starting in a couple of years later, the subtitle says it all. That's, so I'm getting ahead of myself. That was new to many marketers and certainly new to agencies and media. Then came the biggest change that has his, occurred in this world or probably ones that you're going to be able to identify. In 1994, what was it? Absolutely. When the internet came, everything changed. Because what the internet did was very simple. It created interactivity, which we had never, ever had before. We had no way, number one, for us to know what customers were doing, and we had no way for customers to know what we as marketers were doing. So all of a sudden in 1994, which was a watershed year, when the internet comes along, it changes everything. And it's all about interactivity. It's all about how do you interact with and how do you relate to and how do you think about and how do you work with and how do you create value for, value for customers. That's what it's all about. That's what's changed. Because up until 1994, the marketing organization had control over every element. Think about this. How many of you have ever heard of the four P's? Product, price, place, promotion. Where's the customer? Where's the customer in those four P's? We've got one of the greatest proponents of the four P's in the history of the world called Phil Kotler, and he teaches at Kellogg, which is our business school. Product, price, place, and promotion. The marketer at that model controls everything. You decide what product you're going to make. You decide how you're going to price it. You decide how you're going to distribute it. You decide who you're going to tell about it. You decide what price you're going to put on it. You do everything and you control the entire system. The problem with that now is what? I don't have that control anymore. What the hell do I do? That's what's creating the problem. That's why the whole industry is in such turmoil because the controls went away. And you're not going to get them back. You're not going to get them back. You're not going to be able to control the system in the future. So what are you going to do? Panic is not an answer. What are you going to do? when you don't have any control over the system. Because that's what marketing has always been about. I've controlled all of these things. I decided what products to make. I decided when to make them. I decided everything about them. And then I pushed them out there and you were supposed to buy. And the whole system was about what? Persuasion. We're going to persuade you to buy this. We're going to give you such really strong reasons you're going to rush out and buy something. Except what do you have available now? You've got this silly thing called the internet, often referred to as Google. So you can do what? God comes and says, this is the greatest product in the world. You say, wait a minute, let me look at that. Oh, no, you're not. You're only 23rd in the field of 22. So you've got information, knowledge, and access, and I don't have any control. Because I can't keep you from accessing that information. I do a lot of work in China. This last couple of years I've been working with a company called Baidu. Anybody know who Baidu is? 
Of course not. Baidu is the Chinese Google. They're the piece of people that chase Google out of China. <clears throat> Baidu only gets five billion searches per day. That's with a B, five billion searches. Now they have all of that data and what do you think they can do? They can look at who came in, when they went, when they, how long they stayed, where they went to, what else did they do, when they left, all that kind of stuff. So we're trying to get some of this control back, but it's a problem. So what happened then was this. Here comes the internet. The control and availability of consumer and retailer data analytics, it's all called digitalization. Everything is digital today. The other thing that happened is increased focus on customers and insights. What I have to stop talking about is what I want to do as a marketer and try to figure out what the hell you want to do as a customer. Now that's a radically different approach. For me to come and say, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to do when my historic job has been, I made this product and I got to go sell it? So we changed the world. Movement toward the science of marketing and communication, the rise of databases, CRM, all that sort of thing. Increased emphasis on measurement and ROI. And the big challenge and the big opportunity for all of you is globalization. You live in a marketplace which is continuously impacted by what's going on in other parts of the world. We see the tip of it now. We see the tip of it happening all around us. What would you do if faced with the problems with the Ukraine? you're going to have to solve that problem because that problem probably will not be solved in my lifetime. So how do you deal with a system, a marketplace, an idea you can't control? What it does is it forces you into a whole new series of things called negotiation. If you have not ever taken a class or a course in negotiation, go do it. Because your entire life is going to be negotiation. Right or wrong. Because you're going to have to learn how to deal with other people, listen to them, and how do you negotiate with them. We've not taught that very well in the U.S. as evidenced by the problems we face today. But that's another story. So we wrote a book then in 1993, started on it in 93, came out in 94, called IMC The Next Generation. This doesn't have very much in it about the internet, but the concept of what we were talking about is in there. And the reason I say it didn't have much internet in there is because internet developed over time. It wasn't something that suddenly it popped up and everybody was using it. The emphasis continued to be on strategic approaches to marketing and communication. The development of communication processes, not activities, not campaigns, but processes. And processes are things you can repeat, adapt, adjust, and change over time. It focuses on measurement accountability, and quite honestly, there's a bias in there is trying to move communication up in the organization. Today, communication people, essentially, have always been minions. Oh, we'll give that to communication people. Let them worry about it. Because we're going to go off and do big, important, special things. But communication is too important now to leave to senior management. Number one, they don't know anything about it. They don't know what to do with it, and they have no clue as to how to manage it. All you have to do is look at what, pick up the Wall Street Journal any day, and you'll find organizations in crisis. They screwed up, and they have no clue what to do. 
So here are the key I, I to see concepts that were in that book. Customer focus, interactive communications, stakeholders, not just customers, but stakeholders, all the people who are involved, who profit from or generate returns from, communication programs. Message consistency. Message consistency is fairly simple. How do you get the same message coming out of an organization if it's done by digital people, television people, advertising people, PR people, sales promotion people? Because you're sitting there as a customer saying, what the hell, you're all the same company. You're all coming out of the same organization. Why can't all the things you do be integrated and aligned? How many of you have had an unfortunate customer service experience? Why would you have an unfortunate customer service experience? It's because the organization cannot get their act together internally. These guys don't talk to those guys who don't talk to the other guys who never listen to the other guys and so on and so on and so on. So how do you start to change that? Brand focus, relationships, synergy, big word synergy. What the hell does synergy mean? How, does all, how do all these things interact? How do Twitter and Facebook and YouTube, how do they interact? Does doing one help the other? And so on. How do I deal with perceptual integration? That is how people think about it. Reciprocity, which is what? Anybody know what reciprocity is? This is worth coming out on Friday afternoon to learn what this one word means. What is it? Anybody know? What? Shared value, absolutely. How do I create shared value? How do I say you get what you pay for and perhaps a little bit more, and how do I give you back what you want? It forces me to think about customers as people. Oh God, not faceless masses. There are women in here today, 18 to 49, right? And therefore, you are all exactly the same, right? That's what the marketing people say. Women 18 to 49 are all exactly alike. Young men 18 to 35 are all exactly alike. That's because we were trying to create mass communication. Something that kind of talked to all of you but didn't talk to anyone. And part of that has gone away and you have to recognize that. How do I talk about contact points? Where do I come in contact with you? Where do you come in contact with me? How do I talk about cross-functional management? How do I talk about people who are in sales and marketing and customer service and operations, how do I get all those people to work together? That's what you've got to do. So what I'm trying to suggest to you is integrated marketing communication is not a good word for what we really are trying to do. We are really trying to reinvent how businesses operate, how businesses work how people work within those businesses. Because that's what you're going to have to do. You're going to have to do those kind of things. And then we've got continuous planning. So we came up with a little model that looked like this. We call it a five-step process. What does it start with? Anybody read that up there? Customer identification from behavioral data. Historically, what we've done in advertising and marketing communication is we've gone out and we've had a focus group with 12 housewives in Cleveland. <laughs> and then we projected that to the entire world. 
That's the way we've always done it. Because think about where we came from. We didn't know what the hell people did. So we went out and we did a sample of them, and we talked to some who were supposed to be representative, and we projected it to the whole. Today, you've got access to behavioral data. You know what they actually did. You know when they did it. You know how they did it. Then you know how many times they did it. You know all of that stuff. So the real focus here is, how do I move from this idea of attitudinal data, that is, trying to understand and project what you tell me, to what you actually do. So what we really are doing is reinventing and flipping this process over. We're trying to use attitudinal data to explain, and what we really are trying to do is understand the behaviors that we can observe. Second thing we have to do is put a value on those people. How much are they worth? Because until I understand how much you're worth, I have no clue as to how much I'd spend on you which is where the social media people get in real trouble. Because the social media people can't prove to you that they get anything back, but they spend lots and lots of money getting, quote, likes, tweets, all of that good stuff. And somebody says, can you relate that to returns to the company? And the answer is, no, not really, but it sure seems important to know that we got what tweets are trending, right? How many of you follow twin, tw tweet, tweet trends? I mean, that tells you what Justin Bieber's doing. That's critical. The third thing we do is create messages and incentives. Then we estimate return on customer investment. And then we get to budgeting. And this is a strange part of this system that we used. Budgeting is at the end of the process, not at the beginning. Huh, you can't do that way. Budgets are always at the beginning so I know how much money I can go spend. Except our argument essentially is very simple. You have no clue how much you ought to spend until you find out what a customer's worth. He may be worth $1,000, she may be worth $10, he may be worth a million. So what I have to know is what your value is so I have some idea of how much to invest in you. Because it's investments and returns. Is this sounding too much like business and marketing and oh my God, this is dull and boring. Okay, so that's where we are today. I'm going to stop right there and ask if there are any questions. I said this wasn't going to be a lecture but it has ended up being one. I'm going to try to avoid that. Anybody got any questions, challenges, concerns, radical departures from the norm, things that will likely get you thrown out of school? The dean's standing over there making notes. We're struggling with that right now. We really are trying to figure out what we should be calling this. It all has to do with communications. We're con we are absolutely convinced that communication is at the heart of it. And integration is at the heart of it. It's the marketing that creates problems for us. So we are really struggling with that. I'm, uh, we're in the process, in fact, I'm supposed to be having a meeting on Monday where I describe in detail what the new future of this stuff is going to be. So I got all weekend. <laughs> Unless you guys can come up with some really good stuff that I can rip off and take back. Okay. But you're absolutely right. This is part of the problem. We have an unfortunate name, which we thought was very relevant at the time, but we've outgrown our name. And the kind of things we're doing are much beyond just dealing with marketing communication and much beyond doing just dealing with marketing. But if you looked at the definition I gave at the very beginning, we're talking about business processes. How does an organization think about, number one, their customers and how they communicate with them? And how do they listen to them and how do they respond? That's really what we're all about. 
So I'll show you kind of where we've gotten to, and uh, that's in the next part of this. All right, any other questions? Yes. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for the question. <laughs> no, the challenge, the challenge, quite honestly, and uh, is that by and large, organizations have no way of dealing with the future. And it's because of our finance system. Everything is based on one year period. In other words, what do we do at the end of every fiscal year for an organization? We close the books, and the next morning we open them up. So in essence, we kill off every customer on December the 31st, and then we come in on January the 1st and we magically revive them. And that's part of the system. It's very difficult to be long-term, have a long-term orientation when you have to close this stuff down, you have to make a quarterly report, and then you have to make an annual report, and then you have to start all over. Very, very difficult to think about how do I think about investments and returns. That gets you back into some very, very sophisticated management and financial systems which we're working on. Now, I will tell you that you ought to stay in the U.S. because at least we have a view of it being at least a year. If you go to a Chinese company, they want to give you money in the morning, they want it back in the afternoon with interest. They are extremely short term because they're essentially a nation of traders. They're trading all the time and they want returns immediately. So the problem you mentioned is, is true, it's accurate. It's very difficult to get an organization to think about long term which is one of the problems that people have with brands. Brands do not generate returns in the short term. They generate returns in the long term. We don't have very good ways, very good ways of dealing with brands and branding, which is an area where I'm spending a lot of time right now, trying to figure out how do we start to think about allowing you to invest in a brand and not get the returns for three, four, or five years. And that's the big problem. The other problem we have is how do you deal with a system where a company bought WhatsApp for $19 billion? Do you know what you could have done with $19 billion? They decided to spend it on WhatsApp. But for $19 billion, you could have bought American Airlines, the entire company, for less than $19 billion. You could have put up a new Hubble telescope that would be there for 100 years for about $10 billion. Now, what the hell are you going to do for $19 billion? How are you going to get the money back? That's part of the issue. They don't really know how they're going to get the money back, which is the biggest issue of all of this. But send me a note, and I'll send you some stuff on measurement and long-term investment. Yeah. Well, if you look at it that way, but there are not very many people. But it's just, it's just in no, that's absolutely true. Absolutely true. Part of the issue here is the accounting systems were made and invented for a time when you were essentially shipping 40 barrels of wine from Venice to Genoa, and the accountants watched them put them on the, the ship then raced over to Genoa to make sure the 40 got off, counted them. That's where accounting came from. Accounting is nothing more than counting and, and, and allocating. 
The other problem is almost all of our financial systems look backward. Everything that you guys are doing and will be doing is out in the future. That's the big difference between you and what most of your compatriots are doing. Everything you do with marketing communication is I'm going to spend now and I'm going to get something back next week, next month, next year. So everything you do is out in the future. How do you deal with that? Because that's the challenge. It's not a question of counting it. It's a question of can you forecast. So what I'm focused on today is forecasting. I don't care a thing about ROI. ROI happened yesterday, it's over, it's done with, there's nothing I can do about it. How can I become better at forecasting what's going to happen in the future? Because that's where you have to be. You have to be forecasters, not bean counters. And that's the big challenge. Write that down. Forecasters, not bean counters. <laughs> you got that? You want me to repeat it? Okay, you got it? All right, that's good. All right, yeah. I've got a question and I guess a little criticism here. Good. First of all, the question is, you say social media, they can't quantify or give themselves any kind of indication just how much those tweets and those hits add up to them, right? No, yeah, that's true. Well, that's what I said. No different. It is the same thing. It is the same thing, and they've got the same problem. Okay. And the other problem is only because I'm most of my background sales. That's fine. Don't be don't apologize for well, that. Well, actually, under <laughs> that, as you know, the four P's under promotion, you talked about four of them: direct, advertising, public relations, and sales promotion. Mm -hmm. But I've noticed with the textbooks I've run into so far in this program, and even here today, no one talks about professional selling. No. And that seems like it's something that. Well, because it's not digital, they don't seem to give it the same yeah. as the other thing. That's my criticism. Okay. So what do you think about that? Well, I think it's a good criticism. All right. But I reject it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been doing a lot of work with sales and selling and professional selling. Uh, the problem with selling is today, if you look at most of the data, the sales force doesn't come in until about 60 or 50 or 60 percent of the decision is already made. So the sales force comes in to close, but they're not there in terms of prospecting, they're not there in terms of leading, they're not there in terms of creating or managing or representing the brand. So part of the problem we're working with, and the, the way we've approached it, we've said there are two things that are really going on. Number one, most organizations today have networks. You have a network system where you're working through a consortium or you're working through a different kind of organization you're doing something like that. And what in essence you're doing is you're not calling on the sales force, you're asking people in other industries, other businesses, you're going to LinkedIn and saying who's doing this, how are they doing it, that sort of thing. So what's happening is the salesperson comes in after much of the decision is already made. So what we're talking about, what we're doing now is trying to understand the networks, and the other thing I think what we're doing is trying to build strength in negotiation. You've got to, the salesperson has to be a negotiator, and you have to give the salesperson that responsibility, and you have to give them that authority to negotiate to make the deal work, to close. So I, the sales force to me essentially are closers, not prospectors. Now you can tell me I'm wrong, that's fine. No, it's just that that's the one person that, yeah. and, and it's also like, like if I work on a commission basis. Yeah. You've got a new plan coming out and you, that's gonna be a big product in eight months, yeah. 10 months. Yeah. And I see, well, I'm getting 10% of this. You, you ten, when it's a big product, I'll start right. pushing it. Yeah. In other words, there's always gonna be, here's that sales director and all these people over here and marketing's over here and they're different fiefdoms and stuff like that. Absolutely. And it just seems that sales is really not brought in a lot of this stuff I think as early as it should be. Well, and there's a reason for that, and that is because the salespeople don't believe that the marketing people do anything. I know. <laughs> and you know that. Yes, I do. I mean, they're, I mean they're, we got a bunch of idiots, and they're, you know, they're, they happen to be marketing people. 
And uh, historically, marketing has been an organization who was fulfilling the requirements of the sales force. Sales force says, I need a brochure. Marketing guys go rush out and go, oh, we'll get that brochure to you. And that's the way it's historically been. What's happened now is when you switch all of that around and when you flip that process around, suddenly the communication people know a hell of a lot more in many cases than the sales people do. And that's what makes the difference. Way in the back. Hello. Hello. Well, oh, <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. I take back everything I said. <laughs> <laughs> Slowly. Okay. But uh, no, and, and I think that's a very, very valid point. Uh, we just had a conversation about this a couple of weeks ago about how many of you know what social responsibility is? There's your first problem. No one knows what the hell it is. No one has a definition. No one knows where it fits. No one knows how it's supposed to occur. Now, social responsibility, if you go back and look at it, it's what's the corporation's responsibility to their customers? And what's their responsibility toward society? In other words, uh, you've got uh, somebody polluting, and they say, well, the reason we're polluting is because it's less expensive. The fact that people are dying is a detail. But part of the issue is, where does that fall? And most of the time it falls under corporate communication, corporate responsibility. The Chinese will tell you that they're very, very concerned about social responsibility. And the reason they say that is for one reason. I can't keep polluting over time without saying there's a reason. And so my corporate responsibility is, I'm going to get rid of all the coal, but it's going to take me a while. But I think really what you're talking about is what is the responsibility of the organization, not only to its customers, but what's the responsibility of the organization to its societal partners. That's where the stakeholders come in. And we haven't done a very good job of that. It's sort of like uh, you get a lot of comment today about sustainability. Nobody knows what the hell sustainability is. Sustainability for you as a marketer, a manufacturer, is different from me as a consumer or a customer. And so that's a real struggle. Uh, and we haven't done a very good job at it. And part of the reason we haven't done a good, very good job at it is nobody can figure out whether or not it's profitable. If I can't say I spent this and I got that back, you end up on the back row, as you are, trying to say, hey, listen to me back here. And that's part of the difficulty. Okay? Anything else? Are there questions from the field? No. Uh, are they awake? Yes. Blow the whistle. That appears Morgan talking to me? No. Justin Bieber? Is Justin Bieber in there? Not in this one? Okay. Uh, you had a question. Yeah, I was just, uh, back in um, earlier slides, when you were talking about your book, and you said, the first book you came out with, and it was talking about, you know, integration and um, in the integration, the way things kind of look, they all look the same, and that right. was kind of the first iteration. Um, so where, what, what's the next book? What is, what is that part of that book? Amazingly enough, <laughs> what about the future? My God, thanks for the lead. <laughs> you, re you read that really well. I'm glad you, I gla I'm glad you got the card. <laughs> okay, what about the future? What's going to happen? As if I knew, but I have to say I know, because I'm a professor, I'm an emeritus professor, I've been around for a long, long time, and I can speculate, and by the time you figure out I don't know what the hell I'm talking about, I'm gone. Okay, 
So I've got a flight back to Chicago, so you don't have to listen if you don't want to. All right, what's going about, what's happening in the future? Three big changes that are occurring. And three things you have to be prepared for. The first one is from supply chains to demand chains, okay? The second one is from message distribution to message consumption. And the fourth, third one is from the four P's to what we're now calling SIVA or SIVA. So let me talk just for a minute about each one of them. This is the way organizations are structured. This is how they operate. They make stuff in here, they get suppliers from here, they make stuff in here, they push it out, and the sales force job is, damn right, go sell it. Does anybody want it? Details. We can determine how good our sales force is if we build a product that nobody wants and the sales force is able to get rid of it. But that's been around since the Industrial Revolution. So the premise here is, I can make what I can make. I want to make something I can inventory, that I can put in storage so it doesn't lose its value. And all of that worked really, really well until we got into the service economy. Because in a service economy, I can't make stuff in advance, and I can't store it. Services are all about here and now. Services are all about what do I do today to provide you with what you want now. We don't have systems that were aligned to do that because we were all about what? Economies of scale, manufacturing lots more. There's an article today, if you have not seen it, the people in What's the name of the company? Uh, starts with Albertsons is buying Safeway. They'll be the second largest food retailer in the country. And the reason they're buying, they're, they're merging or acquiring is what? Why do you think they're coming together? You think your experience in a supermarket is going to be any different? No. What's going to happen? What do they say that they're doing? Why do they say they're doing this? Economies of scale. We've got 2,600 stores, and now we can go beat on the suppliers and get them to give us better prices. Which means if they give us better prices, I'll give a little bit of it to you as a customer. So part of the problem here is, how do you start to sort that stuff out? This model is the one that is used and maintained by about 97% of the companies all, all over the world. This is what they do. This is how they do it. Where are customers? Yeah, they're at the end where we're going to sell them stuff. We never ask them to, at the beginning, we don't know whether, what they want, what they're looking for, what their requirements are. We're going to make this stuff because we can make it. Here's what we need. We need a demand chain. We need a demand chain that says what do customers want, what are they looking for, what do they need, what would they be willing to buy. Now can I make that kind of stuff? So all we've done is just turn the process around. It's no big deal. But the change that that requires in an organization is mammoth. How do I suddenly start to think about what customers want? How do I think about what they'd like to have? How do I think about what their requirements are? Because if I can do that, I don't have to sell. They'll come buy it from me. They'll come take it away from me. They'll come acquire it. And I take away an awful lot of the costs in the system. So part of the challenge here is how do I start to think about a demand chain? What that requires is what? Back here, this is all about technology, manufacturing technology. This is all about how do I make things less expensively, less 
that require less input. This is all about, where do I learn about customers? That's a whole different game for an organization. Companies are not designed to find out about customers. We don't need to find out about customers because we know all women between the ages of 18 and 49 are exactly the same. And we make one product, and if you don't buy it, it's not our fault. It's because you're dumb customers. Because I made it, and I got the price down, and it's wonderful. Why aren't you buying it? So the thing that happens here in this, your focus is not about operations and technology and making stuff. Your challenge is, is figuring out what customers want what they're looking for, what do they need, what would they be willing to consider, and how do you share value with them? We're still using models that are old, out of date, but they're still embedded in the system. Today, we're still using this model to describe how customers experience communication. Does anybody know how old that model is? Called the hierarchy of effects. In fact, even all the optimization models are based on this. If you're talking about an optimization model that you're trying to use in a, in a, even in digital, it's all based on this. People both go through a process. We move them through that process. It's linear, it's one way, and who's in control? Me, the marketer. Anybody know when that was developed? 1961. Has anything changed since 1961? Well, for one thing, we've got the Beatles, because they didn't come until 64. But what we have in marketing and communication, unfortunately, are embedded models, embedded systems that have little or nothing to do with the way the marketplace is, but we use them, why? Because they're comfortable, and they're safe, and nobody challenges them. Yeah? Push versus pull. Yeah. I mean, uh, there's still gonna be need to push products into the wholesale or into the retail. Yeah. Yeah, there well, there's your problem. Crap, I've got to get rid of this. And, but, I mean, effectively, you're, you know, I mean, the, the, the dealership down this Route 9 here isn't going to sell cars when they feel like it, but Ford says, here's 12 cars, figure out a way to make them disappear. Then they're going to push them on the cars. I mean, can you just, is that model really going to use? Why did Ford make the 12 cars in the first place is the question. Not what they want to push out. Why did they make the 12 in the first place? Why did they make 12 too many? And that's the question that the manufacturer has to answer. And if you understand customers, you would have known, I can't sell that many Fords, therefore, why would I make them? Now, the argument on the other side is, well, we get lots of efficiencies. We get economies of scale. We can run the plant 24 hours, all that sort of thing. Prices go down. But they give it away anyway, so it doesn't matter. But part of the problem is, if you go back to the original demand, that's where the issue is. Okay? All right. Here's what we need to do. It's not a question of what I send out. It's a question of what you access. I started this session by asking you, what do you do the first thing in the morning? And what do you reach for? <sighs> what did Ashton Kutcher do last night? That's critical to my life. You're the one that accesses it. If you don't access it, nothing happens. So it's not a question of what the marketing communication people push out. It's what you take in. How many of you watched television last night? Don't be embarrassed. Hold your hands up. Let's see. How many people watched TV last night? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Twelve out of about fifty. What the hell were the rest of you doing? You should have been watching TV. That's part of the issue. 
If you don't watch TV, all the commercials that ran during that time are wasted, all right? You didn't see them. Nobody saw them. What do you do about that? That's the challenge. That's the difficulty. We need to start focusing on marketing, marketing communication consumption, not what we send out, what you take in. How many of you were on Twitter last night? How many of you were on Facebook last night? If I were trying to reach you, where in the hell should I put my messages? On TV? Let me ask an even better question. How many of you read a newspaper today? One, two. Oh, you did? Yeah. Oh, I, I should have looked in the back. It's not what I send out. It's what you consume. What media forms do you use? How often do you use them? What do they do? How much influence do they have on you? Those are the questions you ought to be asking, not how much, not how much the, the Twitter trending is. That's the issue. Where did you go, and can I figure that out? Needed behavioral measures of customer performance. I need to look at customer income flows. You asked a question earlier about what are the assets. I would argue the assets of an organization are not tangible assets. They are income flows from customers. That's what the organization. The value of the organization is how much income flow it has from a group of customers, and can you maintain that? Because you're, you, in essence, if you've got to plant a factory, a tangible asset, you're depreciating it all the time. Customers can grow. Yeah. I mean, yeah, and I think what you really have to start thinking about is what's the value of the brand. Is it intangible? Yeah, yeah. Well, it's not an intangible. Well, if you talk about cross selling for well over a million dollars, it's sold to Philip Morris. Yeah. It's way beyond. The oh, of course. Of yeah. No, it's not an intangible if it has financial value. I guess. <laughs> See, that's where you get into, the, where's the finance guy? Where's the dean of the management school, the new accountant guy? We need to talk to him, get him in here and get him involved. But the problem is our view of assets in terms of what the value is essentially all comes from customers. And now we've got to figure out some way to start measuring the value of customers. Uh, so we need to aggregate that into customer value, track and measure it over time. Customers treated in investments and returns, and then reinvested. The other one is this traditional four P's planning, product, price, place, and promotion. This is where I get in trouble. Anybody know when the four P's were invented? Anybody know? This is, going to be, this is going to be on the exam, <laughs> so I'll tell you that. 1957. Can you find a marketing textbook that does not have the four Ps in it? No. There are none. But the problem is we're using model system thoughts approaches that are 50 or 60 years old and trying to apply them in a marketplace that's changing every day. That's why it's so difficult to make this stuff work. <laughs> what we're trying to do is this. If I start with the customer, the first question is, what problem do they have? What problem are they trying to solve? You all have problems, you all have issues, you all have concerns which you're trying to solve on a regular basis. My job as a marketer is to figure out what those problems are, and then can I provide a solution? Not can I provide a product, can I provide a solution to your problem? 
So it starts with solutions. What kind of problem do you have? Do I have a solution that fits? Now automatically what I've done is I've created radically different forms of segmentation. Because it's not how old you are or how much money you have, it's whether or not I have a solution to your problem. And if I don't have a solution to your problem, all this hyperbole and all this stuff we do doesn't matter. It doesn't, nothing's going to happen. <coughs> I come in and I say, hey, I can help you get from here to there at twice the speed of sound. And you say, but I can't go from here to there. So how relevant am I to you? And that's part of the issue. So we start with what is the problem the customer has, and then do we have a solution? Now, if I have a solution to your problem, <coughs> a couple of things happen. What do you need to know? What kind of information do you need? What kind of additional knowledge do you need to have to understand that I really do and can solve your problem? The third thing, then, is I need to have some kind of value. I'll talk about value in a minute because value comes in two forms. How much value do you give up and how much value do you get back? And then finally, not how I want to sell it, it's where do you want to buy it? So, S is for solution to customers' problems and concern. Customer's question is, how can I solve the problem I have or expect to have? The answer, here's our solution to your problem. So you're answering solutions you're providing solutions to problems. The second thing is we're going to learn, about, learn more about your solution to my problem. I need to think from your standpoint, what information do you need? What would help you make a decision? What would solve your problem? Value comes in two forms. Value is how much value you get back from that solution. That is, what is the value you get back as a customer but I have to balance that with how much value do you have to give up? And if I, my value is not worth what I'm charging or the cost, nobody's going to buy. And the final one here is access. Where can I find your solution and how easy will it be to obtain? The question is not how I want to sell it, it's where do you want to buy it? You want to buy it online? I damn sure better be online. You want to buy it in a retail store? I better be in retail stores. You want to buy it from a guy who comes knocking on your door? I better have somebody coming knocking on your door. It's not how I want to sell it, it's how you want to buy it. So this is the concept of this idea of SIVA, which is the difference between inside out, that is selling and marketing at the end of the process, versus selling and branding, driving the process from the beginning. That's where we are right now. We're trying to move this forward and trying to build this into a system that organizations and companies can employ. Well, I'm going to show you one real quick story, tell you one quick story about China. How many of you have been to China? Okay, you have? One in the back? Okay. No students? Okay. Then I can tell you almost anything. And the only two people that can contradict me are the ones that we've identified. So you know they're biased. This is a story about a product called Dettol. And this is a true story. This is a story that we documented. The situation in the top 10 Chinese markets where Dettol is supported with television, it's the leading antiseptic brand. Overall, it's the third largest selling antiseptic brand. It's similar to Clorox or Lysol, okay? The challenge is how do I expand to the lower tier of cities and rural areas without television because I can't afford television and media inflation has made it too expensive. So, what do I do? Learn the customer's problems. If you've paid any attention at all to what's going on in China, everyone is very, very concerned about health problems. Contamination is everywhere. Baby food is not even considered. No one, nobody buys Chinese-made baby food because it's all contaminated. 
So part of the issue here is, what do we do? Well, germs are everywhere. Research shows that the brand is known, but mostly for cleaning floors and doing the laundry. So they get a big bottle like this, they keep it under the sink. What we were discovered with the insights is very simple. Mothers are very concerned about the health of their family, the health of their children. So the question is, family health precautions to protect the family. And they had no knowledge that Dettol could do that, that could help them protect their family. So what do you do? If germs are all around, not just on the floor or under the sink, Dettol can help mothers protect their families from illness by killing germs everywhere. You got a problem, here's a solution. Now, obviously you can't carry this big gallon bottle around with you all the time. So what do you do? What they did is they developed a product, a small product, the 100 millimeter, milliliter demonstration spray bottle. Costs only 1.6 RMB, that's about 25 cents. Could be used anywhere. So it's 5% Dettol liquid, 95% water, and incidentally, the Dettol cleans the water as well. So you get 100% where you can use anywhere in Dettol spray. So now I've got a Dettol spray, I've got a solution to the problem. So I develop an experience pack. And the experience pack is a fairly simple concept. All it is, is we're gonna target mothers in the area where we wanna go. So we give them this millil 100 milliliter spray bottle, a leaflet, and a smaller spray for their purse. And we tell the people we gave it to, recruit other mothers and we'll send them one. So it's customer get a customer, essentially what it is. An old, old process, but works very well. So we engage the mothers, they engage the mothers continuously for 12 weeks. They have a web-based community platform. QQ is uh, instant messaging in China, so they're on QQ. Uh, they set up, set up fun missions to learn that you can get points for prizes and so on. The result, top of mind's awareness goes up 5%, five times. Past three months trial goes up five and a half times. Purchase intent goes up two times. And growth in monthly sales goes up. What in essence they did is they got the mothers to sell for them. They recruited the moms which I think is what this next slide is. They've got hundreds of mothers in China recruiting other people as their sales force. That's what integrated marketing is about. That's what starting with customers is all about. That's what SIVA is all about. Here's what Reckett ben, ben Kaiser said. These are the guys that own Dettol. Innovation we delivered was to break from conventional practice with fast-moving consumer goods marketing, model of driving awareness with broadcast content and driving purchase via mass sample, in-store promotions, and couponing has largely been unchanged in the last 50 years, but it's no longer financially sustainable. We found a new way to go to market. Okay? Summary, based on key cons consumer ins insights, provides true utility Easy solution, problem, solution. <laughs> late in the day. Effective co for customers, efficient for marketers, and marketing through and with consumers, not at them. Give you access to the solution. So is SIVA the solution or the future of IMC? This is where we are now. This is what we're trying to develop. This is where we're going. The problem is, and the question is, is that the solution? Not really, because we're now working on the next model and we're in a situation where we must continuously reinvent ourselves, which is the world you're going to live in. You're gonna have to continuously reinvent yourself. And you're gonna have to do that. Somebody can't come and bring that to you. But what we have to do is we have to think more about customer focus we have to think about customer behaviors. We have to relate that to the financials. We have to connect the past and the future. 
and we have to use all the communication forms, that is, all the touch points. That's what we're trying to do. Will we get there? Well, we're getting closer, but we're not there yet. I'm going to leave you with one final thought. This is probably the most scary one of all. This is a woman in Nigeria. She is illiterate. She cannot read. She cannot write. What do you think she's doing? She's on the cell phone, no question about that. What else is she doing? What do you think she's doing? She is doing online banking. And she's doing online banking because even though she is illiterate, cannot read or write, the bank can give her sounds and pictures which allow her and enable her to do online banking. The world you're going to live in is going to be all about sounds and pictures, not about words. Not about words. It's going to be all about sounds and pictures. What that says is you really need to think about design. You need to think about communication systems. You need to think about semiotics. You need to think about all those kinds of things because that's what's going to drive the marketplace of the future. It's not going to be about words. But if you look at what we do and how we do it, everything is write it down. We ask you for reports. We ask you for creative briefs. We ask you for lots of stuff like that. All written documents. But the world you're going to live in is sounds and pictures. That's where you need to be. That's where you need to think about. So if you want to succeed, think about sounds and pictures. Got any questions on this? Do you want to send me an email? If the questions are easy, I will answer them. If they're hard, I will ignore them. Yes? We do have one question. Oh, good. It's one question. Somebody woke up. From, from the online group. Okay. Uh, Mark Van Dyke, who's a professor here. Uh, well, wait a minute. He's remote at, at, at the moment. Oh, okay. Um, he's remote? Well, he's, he's not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. In, uh, in the 1990s, Dr. Jim uh, Grunick from the University of Maryland Maryland and his colleagues conducted a 10-year study funded by the IABC mm -hmm. uh, of excellence in public relations. The study identified principles of excellence in public relations, such as the concepts and principles of IMC that had been described um, earlier. Uh, work in the excellence theory led to a, a description of public relations as strategic communication. What do you see as the differences and similarities Well, I will answer the professor, the good professor, in this way. I have spent the last 15, 20 years trying to kill off the terminology. I'm trying to kill off advertising, PR, direct marketing, sales, and I'm trying to get people to focus on customers and communication systems. PR is something we invented for us, for us to do, for us to apply. Do people go out and say, God, I hope they get some more PR. I'm really missing that. No. And the problem is we use tools and terminology that are important to us, but not important terribly to customers. So I've spent, as I said, I've tried to kill off all this stuff. It's very, that's why we have marketing communication. I push all of this stuff together. Not disciplines that we apply. But if you think about customers, they don't talk about PR, they don't talk about advertising, they don't talk about, oh boy, I got some really, really neat sales promotion stuff here. They say, the guy sent me a bunch of coupons. What the hell? Should I use them or not? So to answer the good professor, I think Professor Grinning has spent his entire life trying to build up PR, and I, I admire him for it. But I think what we're trying to do is not the same thing. Anything else?
Well, shall we adjourn, or do you want to stay a little longer? You want to, do you want to sing? How many want, how many want to sing the, uh, do you want to sing the uh, alumni song or the <laughs> school song? I have one question before I go. What do foxes say? Because I see foxes all over this campus. On, what do foxes say? And I told my wife I would bring back the answer. What do foxes say? I should go on YouTube yeah, and find out what, what foxes say. Okay. Yeah, say, yeah, foxes say a lot of different things. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for coming. Uh, I have really enjoyed my time here. The food has been excellent. The hospitality has been really great. And it's really good to see a bunch of bright, eager people who want to go out and change the world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is the dean back there editing my remarks? Is that what he's doing? Do you have editing control back there? No, you. Steve, do you have editing control so you can take out the stuff you don't like? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Thank you.